This is the Google Teacher Tribe podcast, episode number six. The Google Teacher Tribe podcast is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. The Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. For more great education podcasts, go to edupodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Google Teacher Tribe podcast, your source for the latest news on Google for education, tips, tricks, and teaching ideas you can use in class tomorrow. And here are your hosts, Matt Miller from DitchThatTextbook.com and Casey Bell from ShakeUpLearning.com. Casey, it is the end of February. We're a few episodes into this podcast now, and even though it's the end of February, my goodness, that doesn't feel like February at all. I was just over in Kansas recently where it was in the upper 70s, and I was actually running in my shorts outside. And has it been like that over where you've been in Texas? Oh, you know it. We hit 88 yesterday. It was a. <laughs> it's like uh, the end of of May over here in Texas. Although we did cool off a little bit today, but yeah, we we have not had winter at all. So hopefully we have not hit the um, the February doldrums that we normally hit because of the cold weather and testing, which usually hits around this time. So um, everybody's getting ready, and we kind of hit that downhill slide to to spring break. So, uh, but I'm excited. I'm excited about today's episode. I I think we've got some great things to share. Yeah, yeah. And even though it feels like summer vacation, we're not taking a vacation at all. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what we've got coming? Inside today's episode, we have an interview with the ever fabulous Christine Pinto. You may also know her as Pinto Beans. Uh, She's at Pinto Beans 11 on on Twitter, and she just has some fantastic ways that she is using Google in her kindergarten classroom. She's also the founder of the Gaff for Littles hashtag, so super excited to share that with you. We also have some really fun Google news and updates to share, and a couple of interesting things from our blogs, and I really am excited to share an article with you about virtual reality. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Let's get to it. Well, for our news and updates today, we've got some pretty cool stuff that Casey and I have tracked down for all of you. And the first one that I want to share has to do with one of my favorite tools in Google that's a little bit more obscure, and that is Google Keep. You can find Google Keep at keep.google.com, and it's basically kind of like sticky notes that you can take with you no matter where you go, on your smartphone, on your tablet, on your computer, or Chromebook, or whatever. And so I keep my Google Keep. See what I just did there? I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> and so I keep my Google Keep going on my phone, and I will jot down little things that I need to remember. And I love that once I do that, it syncs it with my account so I can pull them up on my computer or wherever I need to. But Google Keep has, at some point anyway, added this this feature. I don't know if this is like a brand new feature or a newer feature, but it's new to me. And so I thought I'd, I'd pass it along to, to you. And so within Google Keep, in the past, we've been able to make notes using text and using pictures, like photos that we take. But we haven't been able to doodle like with our finger or a stylus or whatever until now. So now whenever you create a new note within your Google Keep, there's an option. There's a little icon that looks like a pin. And if you click on that, now you can draw in different colors. And then whenever you're done with it, you can save it within a note. So if you've got something that's not linear text and it's not a photo, but it's an idea that you want to hang on to, you can put that into Google Keep. And I don't know about you, but for me, being able to jot things down as a picture or a diagram with my finger, that's kind of a game changer. 
Yeah, that's super cool. And Google Keep keeps getting better. I don't know about you, but I have just noticed they have really invested a lot in adding some robust features into something that really seems simple at first. And Google Keep is a is a great tool to help students learn how to organize themselves, manage their projects and their time. If a note gets too long, you can convert it into a Google Doc, which I think is super awesome. You can add voice notes, you can share, you can collaborate, you can do so many things. In fact, Matt, I'm thinking Google Keep might be a future episode. <laughs> oh, we could probably do a whole episode on that. That's uh, just, one of my sorry. favorites. Yeah, I just yeah, I just thought of that. I, yeah, Brilliant, my go. friend. Brilliant. <laughs> Love Google Keep. So yes. a couple of other things to share very quickly. One question I get very often is, is there any way to password protect a file within Google Drive? And as of now, there is not, but... There is the possibility of uploading password protected files that are Microsoft Office files. So you can upload that that and now there's a new feature where you can actually preview those, enter that password and just see the read only version within Google Drive. So not exactly what everybody's asking for, but I think this might be a solution for some of those files that you do need those passwords on. Yes. So again, yeah, that's true. All of the information that we're sharing right now is in the show notes, which you can get at googleteachertribe.com forward slash six. Another super fun <laughs> and interesting update. I don't know if any of you caught this, but Google has introduced something called fun facts into Google search. So very similar to the, I'm, what is it? I'm feeling lucky button that we had. So you can just search for fun facts. You can even put a word like cats, fun facts in front of it, and you get random trivia. And it pops up just in a box at the top. Um, it could be a really fun and interesting way to engage in some conversations with students and uh, probably just have a little bit of fun on your own. So if you like trivia, if you like just kind of finding out random new fun facts try fun facts in google search yeah i could totally see that as like kind of a bell ringer or a real quick fun thing to do right at the beginning of class or maybe at the end of class too absolutely yes and yeah, so yeah. i'm i'm assuming that our our safe search would also apply to this so sorry just thinking out loud i haven't seen it <laughs> right uh, go inappropriate, yeah. but you may want to test this first. Oh, and Matt, that you... never happens. <laughs> no, never happens. Uh, something else super cool that we just found out about a, a couple days ago in Google Sheets. You want to tell us about that, Matt? Yes, yes, I do, actually. Um, so if you've ever made a Google Sheet before and you've put little headers up at the top of your columns... For me, sometimes my headers, I get kind of wordy sometimes, and my headers end up being longer than all the text down below. So I'll have a header that's about five times longer than all of the all of the data that I'm collecting. So if you collect something that's a number, and like all of the numbers are between one and ten, but your header is like four or five or six words long, then you've got this enormous wide column. And if you try to make the column smaller, then it cuts off the header and, I mean, you know, hashtag first world problems. But, mm -hmm. but it's kind mm -hmm. of an annoyance, you know? It is. And so, so what Google Sheets now has is the ability to rotate text. So you can take that header and you can rotate it 90 degrees. So now instead of running left to right, now it runs bottom to top. So this is the way that real paper spreadsheets actually look out in the real world is they have that text rotated 90 degrees so that you can have a nice narrow column. And so that's just one of those little things that I think is going to make our sheets within Google Sheets just look so much better. Absolutely. I, and I, this makes me think back to my old school paper grade book. Um, where, the, mm -hmm. where the columns were twisted that way. And so now that um, people have been asking for this feature forever, I, it really yeah. took us a while to get this in, inside Google Sheets. So this is a, a great one to have. So um, lots of fun updates from Google. It's always fun trying to keep up. Today, we're going to be talking to Christine Pinto, and she is doing one of the coolest things with Google Apps that I can think of right now of pretty much any teacher around. Basically, what Christine does is she's pulling the power of Google Apps into the early elementary classroom. And so we're going to dig into lots of strategies and ideas that she has. But Christine, thank you so much for being on the show. And could you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thank you for having me. Um, so I teach kindergarten this year uh, for Arcadia Unified School District in California. 
And this is my first full year teaching. Last school year, I started teaching um, in January and I taught the spring transitional kindergarten class. So I was working with four and five year olds. I was you know, straight out of student teaching, excited to get my kids using technology. I was becoming familiar with Google Apps myself, and I thought, like, my kids can use these tools, um, and how am I going to get them to use these tools? And that's pretty much when it all started, about, um, about a year ago, coming up in March. So I'm excited to share about how my littles use um, Google Apps. Thank you so much, Christine. We are so excited to share this information with our listeners. I know Matt and I both, you know, we we present workshops to um, pretty much all grade levels. And one of the things that never fails to happen is I will have some of the kinder and first grade teachers especially come up to me and say, my kids can't do this or what do you have for kinder? What, what can they do with this? And I taught middle school. I have never taught a kindergarten classroom and I'm always very honest. You know, I have not taught every subject in every grade level, but I can reach out and find people who know how to do this. And so that's exactly what we're doing right now is we want to be able to um, share all of your goodies with our teachers who teach the itty bitties, the gaff for littles. One of the things we would love to hear about really though, and and you're such a young teacher, but what was the spark really that got you interested in in using Google in the kindergarten classroom? I started becoming familiar with Google Apps when I was student teaching. Um, They were kind of around when I was like in college, like, you know, like in my technology course, like, you know, here's, here's a Google doc and here's how you can add collaborators. But that was pretty much the extent of it. Um, when I was student teaching, my master teacher exposed me to Google classroom. I, at first, obviously in student teaching, you're just trying to get used to everything teaching. But then I remember about halfway through, I told her like, I really want to get familiar with Google classroom. So I got to explore it with the big kids. I did student teaching with fourth and fifth graders. And then the spark with the little guys, I was just so excited to get them started creating with technology. And uh, at the time with the class that I was with, we had iPads, we had six iPads and we had um, access to the computer lab once a week. And I was like, okay, well, this is the technology that we have and this is the technology that they are going to use. And um, it wasn't easy to really find a whole lot of teachers who had used Google Apps with their primary kids. Um, I also attended a, a, a gaff summit and I remember sitting in a Google drawing session and just like, we were just like inserting shapes and I'm like, my kids can, my four and five year olds can totally do this. So then the next part was just like, okay, now how are they going to access classroom? It was a lot of fun that first day. I think back to, um, just explaining to them what Google classroom was like, you know, we have like a computer classroom, like, you know, you know how we have our own classroom inside the classroom Well, there's a classroom <laughs> that could happen on the computer. You know, and so, so the big kids use That's this so stuff cute. and you can turn in your work like you turn in your work to your cubbies. Well, you can turn in the work on the computer. And they were just so excited to just like run with it. I mean, of course, they're four and five. So, I mean, they get excited about pretty much everything anything and everything, but, um, they just ran with it and we were in Google job like for the first assignment and, and all went well, they all, you know, got logged in. Okay. Like, and, um, it was great. And then from there, I did, I was just, you know, determined to find some like better activities and to do more with them because I knew that they could produce more. I just had to kind of work their powers. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Gosh, that's so cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So I am very curious, though, because one of the things that um, when I'm presenting on Google Classroom, I don't always recommend Google Classroom for every grade level. And I, I explain it really in the fact that it depends on the teacher and it depends on the students um, that, you know, I have seen it used at every grade level. And so obviously you are proving this correct. But can you tell us how do you get through the login struggle that so many suffer with? Right. So this year with my with my group, I'm one to one with Chromebooks. So the kids have they all have their own Chromebooks. And so for me, that was like a new spin. I was like, OK, how is this going to go? How is this going to go? I have um, labeled the kids Chromebooks with colored tape with the scotch washi tape on the side. Um, so each row on the keyboard has its color of tape on the side so like the the row with the numbers uh for my kids it's the red row and then the next row with the q with the qwerty with the qwerty that row is yellow and so uh, i had them i created login cards for them and their login cards um the background of like a number or a letter 
um, corresponded with the color of tape on the side of the keyboard row. And I have a, a, a blog post on that. I can share that with you. That was how my kids logged on this year because it was, it wasn't, they weren't asking me, Miss Pinto, where is this key? Because I like, you know, they didn't need to ask me because they had a color that they can kind of go to and, and match the letters together. Of course, when you're starting out in kindergarten at the beginning of the year, not all your kids know the letters and not all the kids know the numbers, but they can definitely match like anything else with education. You kind of like work with the skills that the kids do have and they have matching skills. That's how they got logged on. Um, I had my kids logging in this year. Second day of school, I was anxious to get them starting to use the technology, but we had to get over that login hurdle. And um, now here we are, you know, it's just like a number of months into the school year. And they I, I could take for granted now that they know how to sign in. It's just a matter of like, OK, introduce the activity and I'm going to release you to go get your Chromebooks. And I have kids logging in and and the other kids are still getting their Chromebooks out of the cart because like, you know, you, you can't have them all get them at the same time. So I, you know, I have kids in the activity while other kids are still getting their Chromebooks out. And that's how fast they can log in now. Yeah, that is so cool. So I kind of want to walk through like sort of a typical day with uh, you and your kiddos and, and Google Classroom or just Google Apps in general. And so we've got the login part kind of figured out. And I know we've gotten to talk a little bit about some of the things that your kids can do. And so I wondered if you could tell us maybe one or two just sort of like basic activities, kind of like a framework with Google Apps that you can use that the younger kids, it's something that they can do. Because I think that's something that I, I always hear or read you coming back to is the the whole idea of, yes, they can. It's like, oh, little kids can't do this. Well, kindergartners can't do this. And you're like, uh, yes, they can. So um, show us just kind of um, maybe describe in your own words what one or two of those basic activities are so other teachers might be able to try them too. Obviously, at first, they're just trying to get familiar with the tools. I mean, can't, I tell people you can't take for granted that the kids haven't some kids haven't seen a Chromebook before, like even before the school year even started. Right. Um, if you don't mind me going back a little bit, like yeah. before the school year started, like day one on the first day of school, like they had no idea what they could do with the Chromebook, you know, like, oh, you can, you know, uh, my dad does work on a, on a computer or, you know, you watch movies on there or, you know, and like now, like now coming into like some of the things that they have done, one of the first things I had them do was just, they took a selfie and they inserted some shapes. They learned how to insert an image and then they know how to take a snapshot because that already opens up the gateway to like, okay, so if we do something where, um, I need you to bring some, something to the Chromebook to take a picture of. You need to know how to take a snapshot. So, um, and then inserting the shapes, just understanding like when you, okay, so there's like things that are on the computer, like little tiny pictures. They kind of look like buttons. Those are called icons. You click on those and they can do something. Right. Um, and then even like, you know, okay, so now you inserted the shape and then like I say, little things that you can't take for granted. Like when you hover over like a shape, you know, you have that compass that comes up, you know, we like make like a motion sign for like the compass. And, you know, when you, when you see the compass, that means you want to grab something. So you click on it. When you see the blue outline now, it's selected. You caught it. And now you can do something to it. You can stretch it out. You can change the color. And um, oh, my favorite one has to do with the cursor. Can you do that one real quick too? One for the kids that gets them in the beginning, especially with like the login part. Like if they don't click on like enter your username or something like that, like they're like, I'm typing, but nothing's happening. And I was like, okay, well, you don't have like a dancing line. The you need to line. click so you have like that dancing line coming up. And yes. um, a lot of the times they're like, oh, okay. And so I don't have any dancing line problems anymore. But <laughs> so is that the one you were talking that about? That was the one I was hoping you were going to do. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes, like, I forget, like, which curses are might be coming up, and it's some that we've gone over, some of them we haven't, mm -hmm. but it helps to kind of, like, front load them with that stuff because, you know, there's some kids, obviously, who I don't need to even tell them that stuff. They'll probably just click around and figure it out. There's other kids, though, who, you know, are, you know, who, who kind of need a little bit more information. Like, you know, what am I looking for? How come when you did that, that worked, but when I'm doing it, it's not, you know? Yeah, yeah. So. That's a great idea. I love that. Um, moving into the Google products that you use, the Google tools, obviously you use Google Classroom, but how do you think using these products has transformed not only your class, but what you do as an educator? 
the activities kind of take what we're doing in the classroom to like another level. So, and they're, they're like, they're learning the basics right now too. So when I say taking it to the next level, uh, well, I guess two examples that I have. So like a typical graphing activity, like, you know, you create, I mean, in kindergarten, I think the standard is for them to create like a, a picture graph or whatever, but the graphs that I had them creating are like beyond that. And they're creating like bar graphs. And I have a template where the kids are manipulating a Google drawing inside of a spreadsheet. So they kind of create a picture with a bunch of different objects. So we have like in the beginning of the year, they did like leaves on a tree, you know, how many red leaves you want to have yellow leaves and orange leaves. So they drag leaves from the side and the drawing and they create like, you know, leaves on a tree. And then they graph that information with a bar graph. You know, it is what it is. It's a bar graph. We're using spreadsheets for what it's for <laughs> to, to graph information, to chart information. And um, that is that's such an essential skill because, you know, they're building that foundation right now with that. Later on, they're going to be doing a lot more than just bar graphs. Um, also, um, recently with the kids, I had them start out. Uh, we've been talking about like making five and making 10 and the different like equations that you can make to come up with those sums. They were using um, uh, the template that I have that allows them to change the cell color and um, create models first of all so like you know two cells are blue and three cells are red and then they have to go and they have to type in that equation you know so just like I mean the basic typing skills but also like you know you're typing an equation and then the part that just tickles me was that they like they started right typing they check their answer by typing in the equal sign first and when you type an equal sign in a spreadsheet that's like the start to like a formula or something like that so they're checking their work, you know, equal sign, you know, two plus three. And that kind of helps with like the, you know, decomposing a number too, because that's some stuff that we've talked about. Like, you know, why don't we have to type in the five? It's because you're checking your answer. Does five equal two plus three? You know, so um, <laughs> just kind of like giving them different ways of thinking too. As far as, like, like I said, that, that takes our activities to a different level. So, um, and also uh, as far as like tra how it transforms what I'm doing in the classroom, I've used Google Classroom for like things, like if we create as a class, if we're discussing something and we create like a thinking map or a graphic organizer, I will push that out to the kids so they all have viewing access to it. So if we do a writing or something, they all have it right there in front of them. You know, so it's not like the struggle, like, you know, there's the posters on the board, but I said way over here and I don't know how to spell that word. So I have to go run over here and go look at it. So it helps for them to have that that access like right there in front of them. Anything, anything and everything we do, we start out in Google Classroom, believe it or not. So like even if it's like an outside website, like the kids know, like, you know, some of their like little favorite games that they like to access, they go to I put them in the about tab and that's where they go to access that stuff. Um so it's Very pretty neat. Yeah, a lot of the times they're um, they just they they log into their Chromebooks, they click on Google Classroom, and they know that they're doing something in there. So um, that's always like our our startup because like that's our consistent workflow, and that's how things have just worked in our classroom. Brilliant. Yeah, and I think that makes such a big difference is being consistent with the way that you use these tools. Um, so that and that's I, I think that's true for any grade level that you know yeah. the kids are going to know what is expected of them, and they're going to know exactly where to go to find um, their assignments and their information. And um, speaking of assignments and information, you gave us a fantastic lesson. So the Google teacher tribe is going to love this lesson and you will be able to access this in the show notes from Google teacher tribe.com forward slash six, since we are in episode six and, um, it is just, it's so fun. And I love that you have this animated GIF of exactly what it does. And it shows, you know, how the, the kids can input the numbers for each of, uh, let's say make five, make 10 and make 20. And you made all of these templates. Are these in um, Google drawings? I mean, they're in sheets. I'm sorry, Google sheets. Yeah, so they're all in spreadsheets and they all have their own little tab down there on the bottom. So it's like one spreadsheet, four activities. Like there's, they're friendly from, you know, from, TK to second grade, um, I, you know, I always, always, always start out with your, you know, your learning goals, your learning objectives, what are the kids going to be doing? And so I do try to think, you know, have in mind, like, you know, I teach kindergarten, but I do, what are my kids going to be doing when they're, when they're not with me anymore? I need to create some stuff. So that way they have something for when, you know, when they're, when they're, when they're past me. And, um, 
I, so yeah, so I created, uh, I had my, that template started out with just the make 10. Uh, so can you, you can make 10 with two colors. And, um, so I, I was kind of describing that earlier where it's kind of like when we're talking about making 10 now. So, you know, if I have, um, there's like a color key on the side and you choose which color, which, which color you want, that there's a number next to it that tells you what number to press into the cells. And so if you want like three blues, you know, you type in like the four and you have, um, you know, three blues. And then if you want seven greens, you type in the number for the green and now you have a model and then you type an equation and then you check your answer. Um, so then I just made that, I, you know, I just extended that a little bit to, uh, um, to what my kids were working on, which is making five at first. So kids are building fluency with making five and 10 and first grade, you're still building that fluency of making 10. And then I just expanded it a little bit in the other direction for second grade, because they start to develop, um, that, like that foundation for multiplication with like arrays and everything. And that's how it ties in with second grade. And uh, I, yeah, that, that template gets me all excited. Cause, um, you know, cause that was the, like one of the first ones I've been able to stretch it out, to go out to different grade levels. So it's really mm-hmm. cool. Check it out. It's, it's, yes. it's awesome. And I'm assuming this is all using conditional formatting in, yeah. in Google sheets. Yes. And I, I have to give a shout out to my buddy. I have to give a shout out to Alice Keeler because I, everything that I have learned in a spreadsheet, I have learned from Alice Keeler. So <laughs> I, I kind of probably actually kind of like maybe probably stole maybe like one of her templates or like a couple of her ideas to make this one. And she's like, well, aware of it because like she's posted about it and uh, we work really closely together. But a big shout out to her because I learned all that conditional formatting stuff from Alice Keeler. When you were so talking we about all learned from Alice yes. Keeler. <laughs> yes, I agree. And when you were talking about this being on a spreadsheet, I was like, hmm, I wonder where yeah, she got the idea to put those in spreadsheets because Alice is kind of the queen of the spreadsheet. Oh, yeah. So. Everything has an answer in a spreadsheet, right? That's yeah, awesome. yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I'm sorry, Matt. The, the other thing I just wanted to point out because I'm looking at her blog post, which details this lesson, is she yes. also goes into detail about how to assign this inside of Google Classroom. And she gives her sort of own reflections about the activity um, with students. And she's even got an awesome winter scene graphing activity that's included down here. So you don't want to miss um, this this really great uh, lesson from Christine. So to kind of wrap this up, Christine, I'm kind of amazed at all the different things that you have going on. I mean, and we'll, we'll have links to all of these in the show notes. So if you're listening and you're wanting to know where you can find all of these, that's the place to go is to go to googleteachertribe.com slash six. And so you've got the hashtag going on, which is the gaff for littles hashtag on Twitter, where people can share ideas and strategies and, and teaching tips for using Google in the classroom with young kids. You've got even got gaff for littles workshops going on. You're working on a book with the aforementioned Alice Keeler about using Google Apps with with younger kids and everything. So I'm just amazed by all of this, and I'm hoping that people will go into the show notes and will check some of this stuff out, especially if they're teaching in the elementary school setting. So before we let you go, I wanted to wanted to have you tell us where the best place is to find all of your good stuff and be able to get in contact with you. Okay, so I have a blog, and my blog is christinepinto.com. I do a lot of sharing on Twitter. Uh, on Twitter, I am at Pinto Beans with a Z, 11. So uh, the best way to get in touch with me is on Twitter. Yeah, and check out my blog. <laughs> Awesome. Very good. Hey, this has been awesome. There's been so much good stuff here. I know people want to go run to those show notes at googleteachertribe.com slash six to get all of that good stuff. So Christine, thank you so much for sharing all these ideas for all of the awesome things that you do with your kids. And I think I speak for all of us in saying, keep up the good work because we're, we're really learning from you. So thank you so much. Yes. Um, thank, thank you. you. I will be sharing your stuff. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you guys having me on and I really admire and love what you are doing. Uh, I am excited to tune into the teacher tribe every week. So, you know, I will be listening. That's awesome. We didn't pay her to say that either. <laughs> no, we didn't. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Christine. Thanks. So Casey and I have found some interesting stuff out there on the blogosphere. And Casey, you were telling me yours is a it has to do with virtual reality. This sounds really interesting. 
Yes. So actually, I, f- I found this article. Google for Education tweeted this out, and it's it's not a blog post. It's an article from New York Magazine. The title is In Virtual Reality, Women Run the World. So wow. you know I had to click on that. Yes. Uh, so it is a really interesting article. They are claiming that a new generation of female artists are actually making VR the most diverse corner of an already male dominated tech space. So we all know that there's a, a huge gender gap in the technology industry, especially in coding and programming and things like that. But apparently women are making their mark in VR. And so I just found this extremely fascinating. It's a pretty long article, but they introduce you to all of these interesting women. So there is an animator, an editor, there are um, some musicians. Bjork is in this, yeah. actually. Bjork's in it, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and so uh, gaming, everything is in this. So it's just really fascinating to read. So again, this link will be in the show notes. But I, I want to share a couple of statistics in this that I found very, very interesting. So virtual reality is still in its infancy, but expected to be a $150 billion industry by 2020. And because the technology is so new and so different from anything else happening in Silicon Valley, female creators have gotten a rare opportunity to start from a level playing field. So virtual reality is so new that it has no formalized industry yet. And there's no hierarchy. So there's no male dominated sort of hierarchy to break through right now. So it's particularly welcoming to the outsiders and to newcomers. So um, women have not only been at the forefront as creators, but as producers, writers, and financiers. So I just I just think this is a really interesting article. I would love to hear um, other people's take on it as well. And of course, I find virtual reality in general just so fascinating. But again, helping, helping girls and young women get interested in technology careers, I think is a really important part of being a teacher today. Yes, yes, absolutely. And of course, we hate the fact that this is even an issue and that there are, you know, glass ceilings and and all of these things. But I I do, just like you said, I find it fascinating that because there's no formal structure, there's not a structure that women feel like they, you know, that they have to beat. And so, you know, it, it really is, like you said, a level playing field. That is, that is fascinating. I love it. So for my side of this, I wanted to introduce you real quick to a blog post that I just recently published. We did on my regular Thursday Ditch Book Twitter chat, we had a topic just a couple of weeks ago about what I wish someone had told me about teaching. And we were having some college students from South Carolina join us that night. And so we came up with all of these questions. It was longer than our normal 30-minute chat. And so we uh, we came up with all of these questions about what I wish someone had t- told me about. And we talked about like what we wish someone would have told us about relationships with students and with using technology in the classroom and collaborating with others and giving homework and communicating with parents. So we had all of these topics. And I, as the this chat was going on, I just kept thinking, my goodness, there are all of these inspiration bombs that are just going off in this chat. And so I knew that I had to share some of them with my blog readers. And so I went back through that Twitter chat and I pulled out 100 things from that chat and created this post called 100 Things I Wish Someone Had Told Me About Teaching. And so it's basically just all of these answers to those very questions from the folks that were in our chat. So I found it fascinating to go back through. And we have teachers from all different walks of education. You know, we've got elementary teachers. We've got high school teachers, math, science, social studies, electives, uh, instructional coaches. I mean, just everybody um, from their own background and from what they're doing now. And so I found it a really fascinating thing. So um, just wanted to point you guys in that direction um, because, I mean, we can all use a little bit of inspiration every once in a while. Absolutely. And I love this post. And we all have those moments where we wish we had known something before we went into teaching. But um, this is a great post. And Matt, when is the chat? Because your chat is always a great learning experience as well. Thanks. Yeah. No, uh, the the chat is on Thursday evenings uh, for those like me in the Eastern time zone, it's from 10 to 1030. If you're in the Pacific time zone, seven to seven 30. Um, so yeah, we're doing it pretty much every Thursday and you never know what topic is coming next. That's awesome. All 
All right, Casey. So it's time for the mailbag, and we've got a great question that was submitted to us. Really good question. This is from Robin Limpert. She is from Cincinnati, Ohio, and here's what Robin says. She says, as a primary educator, I would love to hear more about integrating Google tools into our primary grades K through three. And so it sounds to me, Robin, like maybe this was the episode for you. You may have already gotten some good ideas from Christine. Then she says, most of us have iPads and using Google on iPads is a very different animal, which is so true. We're starting to see Chromebooks become more primary friendly, and I'm excited about that. But for now, do you have any ideas for us using both iPads and Chromebooks? So, Casey, what would you tell Robin? So definitely have a big shift in education. So I know, especially in Texas, iPads were king for a while. And I did a lot of iPad training. And so when everybody started going Google, I started getting all of the requests for using Google apps on the iPad. And and I've done that several times. I will tell you, I have not been asked to do that training in a while now. I'm being asked to do a lot more with Chromebooks, but they can play nicely. It's a little bit different. I do have several resources on my blog and I try to keep a list of all of the Google apps that work on iOS. I think it it is, like she says, a very different animal and we have to just keep in mind that things just don't work exactly the same way. However, I think we have come leaps and bounds from where we were when we first started using Google on the iPad. I think there are so many things you can do. In fact, there are things that you can do on an iPad that you can't do on a Chromebook, like annotate in Google Classroom. So that's a really interesting uh, feature that is available on iOS, and students can actually draw on top of their assignment, whether that's a Google Doc or a PDF or whatever it is, and submit that. And so those types of tools are definitely more primary friendly. The iPad is obviously more primary friendly at this point. Uh, and if you've listened to the previous episodes, you've heard us mention the ability to use Android apps on Chromebooks is coming, as well as the new Flip Chromebooks that are both touchscreen tablets and sort of the traditional type of laptop. So we're sort of bridging that gap. So there are tons of of different apps that will work on the Chromebook and iPad. You just have to do a little bit of searching. Sometimes they're Chrome apps that you can install to have those work. But the creation on Chromebooks is growing. I think that is really what set iPads apart is that so many users saw them as the creativity tool and the Chromebook more as a productivity tool. And I think we just have to kind of think outside the box. So I will add some resources to the show notes for using um, Google on the iPad as well as some Chrome resources for you. And thank you so much for that question. I hope we can help and I hope it only continues to get better in terms of using G Suite on the iPad. Yes, agreed. And if you want to find those resources, of course, the best place to do that is to go to googleteachertribe.com slash six to get those show notes. And next, we have a voice message, and this comes from someone that I know Casey and I both respect a lot, and his name is Michael Fricano, and so we're going to throw it over to you, Michael. Aloha, Casey and Matt. This is Mike Fricano um, at EdTechNocation, coming to you from the beautiful state of Hawaii. Just want to say I'm really digging the new podcast. It's my uh, Monday morning podcast. Listen to it every Monday and I um, can't wait for the next one to come out. Um, keep it up and uh, mahalo. Ah, this is so cool. Thank you, Michael, so much for that comment. And I know actually this is a perfect place to, to have his comment in because Michael is a great resource also for all things Google, but also for virtual reality. Casey just mentioned that article about virtual reality and he's showing some, some really neat resources and some ways that it ties into education. And so if you want to check out his website, it's at edtechnocation.com. So edtechnocation.com. And he's also on Twitter at edtechnocation. And if you're not sure how you would spell that, <laughs> feel free to go check it out on the show notes, <laughs> googleteachertribe.com slash six. Thank you so much, Mike. It is always a pleasure to connect and learn with you. Someday we will actually come visit you in Hawaii, I hope. And um, yeah, me yes, too. love love what you're doing, love your resources, and your stamp of approval means the world to us. Thank you. All 
All right. Well, that pretty much brings this episode to a close. And oh, my goodness, there was so much good stuff in this episode. I know whenever I hear Christine talk or see her stuff on Twitter or wherever, one of the big things that I'm always reminded of is that we can't, as teachers, we just can't make assumptions about what all of our kids can and can't do. We've got to be able to give them a, give them a chance. And so when she says, when she's talking about these, these littles, these young kids, and she says, yes, they can, we can't just tell, tell them that they can't because we don't think that they can. I just think that's such an important takeaway message. Absolutely. There, there were so many great quotes in there from Christine. She is just, right. she's doing some great things and proving that it doesn't have to be with the upper elementary grade levels or even in secondary that you can do these things. These kids are capable and we need to give them more credit for being able to do the things that they can do. Yes, yes, definitely. So, so that pretty much puts a bow on this episode. You can find all of the resources that we shared at googleteachertribe.com slash six. And in our next episode, we're going to be digging into some of these new features that come with using video within G Suite. So we're going to be talking slides, drive, ways to create video, ideas for how you can implement it in your class. And I always love talking about video, so I'm super pumped for this episode. Me too. I can't wait, Matt. All right. So I think that wraps it up. Thanks again so much for joining us, and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye, y'all. Thanks for listening to the Google Teacher Tribe podcast. Keep up with every new episode by subscribing on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, and by visiting googleteachertribe.com. Get in on the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag GTTribe. Until next time, keep harnessing the G Suite power. And may the Googles be with you. Have you noticed that we've gotten the episode number right like every single time? (laughs) It's because I finally remembered it's on the page. (laughs) I know. (laughs) It kind of makes a difference, doesn't it? Yeah, I can be so blind. Chris, don't use that. (laughs) (laughs) He's going to use it. He's going to use it.